Uh, let's cut to the chase, man. 500 bucks, that's the most I can do. It's gonna be a few hundred bucks to frame it. At the end of the day, I'm only making a few hundred bucks and it, it's gonna take me a while to sell it. Rick makes a slam dunk deal for Hall of Fame basketball cards. Beautiful art fails to move Rick to debt. Things get rocky when Rick refuses to pay a lot for an iconic rock band. Alien is kicked back to outer space with Corey's offer. When it comes to negotiating, Rick is famous for his brutal lowball offers. Let's look at times customers were faced with legendary final offers. Rick loves basketball as much as the next guy, but his primary sport is bargaining. If this was a match, he would win, as the customer ends up selling for almost a tenth of his ask. Hey, what do we got there? Got some pretty cool sports autographs here for you. Okay. Um, so these are action-packed. Yes. And they're 1995. Right. Action Pack actually went out of business in 95. And that's when the sports card bubble just but when you start getting these crazes where everyone's buying them because they're going to be worth a fortune and they're going to resell them, that's not collecting, that's speculating. According to Tyler, the cards are autographed, authenticated, new, and worth a house in Ohio. Well, let's see what happens when he tells the expert that. A storage locker here in Las Vegas. So you got Bill Walton, he played for Portland. Senator Bill Bradley, he played for the New York Knicks. Bob Cousy, played for the Celtics. And Bill Russell. So how much you want for these? Um, in total, all 507 cards. I'm looking to get 120,000 for them all. Um, sounds like a lot. Dan's first reaction to the cards isn't pure adoration, and that's never a good sign for valuation. Regardless of what happens with the deal, the guys learn a lot about Basketball Hall of Famers. That knowledge might just prove helpful one day. A lot of gold. This gentleman right here has um, all these basketball cards that are signed by the players. They're from Action Pact, but it seems like the company went out of business before they were able to release these cards. Bob Cousy, another big Boston Celtics Hall of Famer. Signatures are really nice on this one. And you got here Senator Bill Bradley, who almost became president of the United States. Yep. But it seems like every single card from this set, it's all Hall of Famers. Yes. It's time for business, and Tyler is nervous to hear the expert's verdict. If it isn't favorable, the trip back home will be heavy with boxes and disappointment. We all know, as far as supply and demand, things come down as things pop out. Okay. I don't know exactly what you want to do. I'll give you 25 grand for all of them. That's pretty low. Um... No, it's not. It's hundreds of hours. It's not only what I pay you, it's everything else involved with it. Wow. From 120000 to 25000 that man deserves to be in the Negotiator's Hall of Fame. I feel it's a headache, it's a project. Um, I don't really want to be tied into him for as long, and, and you're willing to do the work, so you know what, I'll, I'll do that 25. You got a deal. All right, sweet, we got a deal. I'll meet you right over there. We'll do some paperwork, I'll get you paid. Thank you, sir. By their styles, you should know them. Rick immediately recognizes the art brought into his store. Still, whether or not he'll pay for it is another matter, and Willie can only hope and negotiate. I'm just assuming it's a Peter Max. <laughs> that it is. Pretty interesting. Peter Max has got a, a really weird storied life. You know what I mean? This guy was born in, like, Nazi Germany, but his family doesn't go, like, to the States or England. Peter Max has a very distinctive style, and he's still popular today. He's done posters for the Olympics, the Grammys, and a host of other things. His work has been known to sell for over $100,000. He might be excited to sing praises for Peter Max's skills, but Rick becomes a lot less articulate when it comes to parting with his cash. To be fair, Willie is asking for a lot. How much are we looking to get out of it? Based on what the market is, I'm trying to get about 35000 Whoa. Um, let me have someone look at it. I mean, the problem with Peter Max is there's, there's, he has so much stuff out there, OK? I'm not taking away. I mean, he's really, I mean, mega iconic. People absolutely love him. Brit's appraisal is music to Willie's ears, and he's ready to paint Vegas red with the cash he gets. But there's a hurdle to be crossed, which is the Porn King. If you know Rick, getting money out of him isn't easy. And he was one of the very first artists that would paint to music. Uh, he would actually, you know, play the music. And you can see that his work, even to this day, has a real lyrical quality. You can almost imagine the jazz music playing in the background. Don't think it's a print. OK. And then he added the acrylic, all the different colors and the uh, embellishments around the side. So uh, it's definitely an original, and it's, it's certainly a one of a kind. Someone has turned off the music. 
Brett might appreciate the art, but his points will make it almost impossible for Rick to pay a considerable sum for the painting. I, I just, because I know there's a lot of them out there. Right, right, yeah. The good news is this is a fairly iconic image. You know, the Statue of Liberty, he's identified for that, so that's a good thing. So I think an appropriate value for a work like this would probably be in the, the $25,000 range. It's time for negotiations, and Rick is brutal. Willie doesn't stand a chance with that reasoning. Realizing Rick won't budge, he makes a choice. That's price you take. I'm, I'm pretty firm on my, my $35,000 price. I'll go 12 grand. All right, you got a deal. Sweet, man. Follow me, and we'll do some paperwork. Sounds good. This way. If you're familiar with rock and roll, you probably know Led Zeppelin, a band that rocked in the 70s. Like Robert, you probably expect a collectible from the band to be pricey. What do we got here? Led Zeppelin one signed by the full band. By the full band, I only see one. Jimmy Page signed the front, and on the rear, John Bonham. Hey, this is really amazing. Led Zeppelin is one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time. Every one of their albums was in the top 10, and six of their albums were number one. While Rick agrees the band has a huge following, himself included, his enthusiasm is probably not in the 20 grand range and Robert would need to do a lot of convincing to get even half of his ask. How much would you pay for a collectible from your favorite star? The big question is, how much do you want for this? 20 to 1,000. As far as Led Zeppelin collectors go, this is the holy grail to Led Zeppelin items. Well, trying to put together a signed Led Zeppelin album is really difficult. Uh, John Bonham died in 1980. Robert Plant, uh, John Paul Jones, Jimmy Page, they're not really that accessible. The expert has good and bad news, but of course he gives the good news first. Right there, ballpoint pen. Um, and you take a look right here. Oxidized, it's a little older. You know, you could tell. Nice aged ink. Okay, so it's all legit. Based on everything I've seen, absolutely no doubt this is the real deal. Sweet. With that kind of appraisal, Robert is probably expecting a valuation that beats his, and who can blame the guy? But this is where the expert delivers his bad news, and what a blow it is. But with that said, I put this value right at about ten dollars to $12,000. Okay. Okay. I, you know, I respect your opinion, yeah. but you know, we all have opinions. You, you do realize that Jimmy signed... The reason why Jimmy didn't follow suit with the other three... If I'm a collector, and if I'm someone looking to buy a high-end collectible, and especially to spend a huge amount of money, I'm going to want all those signatures to be together and be displayable. Rick is still interested, but with his final offer, Robert might just be walking out the door with his prized possession. Again, miles apart on this. You know. I mean, what's your best price on it? My best price... Uh, would be 17.5. Yeah, I mean, I'd go 8,500, but... No, I, I'm sorry. You know, okay. I appreciate the offer. Being better than the teacher is what everyone wants to be, and that is what Corey is to the horror of customers who try to negotiate with him. When he comes in with this item, a customer gets a taste of the Harrison well of knowledge and love for cutthroat deals. What do we got? I have an H.R. Giger limited edition book that also has a lithograph signed and numbered. You can tell exactly what it's from. This is the one that had like the other like baby alien inside his mouth, right? Exactly. His first works were ink drawings and oil paintings, and then he discovered airbrush, who was, it's what he's really known for. The next thing is, of course, determining the authenticity of the album. It would hurt to find out it's a replica made for art class. The expert is the same as the last transaction, but let's hope this customer has better luck. Definitely pretty cool. And how much are you looking to get? I'd like to see 600. 600? Okay. Um, the signature is what makes it really unique. I'd like to have a buddy of mine come down and check it out. H.R. Giger became this really famous guy based off Alien, and next thing you know, the rock stars latched onto him, and they wanted to use him for artwork for their albums. So the guy's place in the movie and the music industry is pretty big really choppy, up mm -hmm. and down. You could see the formation on both of these. There's absolutely no question in my mind. Real signature here, Corey. Well, that's good news, but Corey still needs to know how much of Rick's money he can part ways with to get the Alien album. Any idea of what you think it might be worth? Well, you know, I think the interesting thing about this is that it's a nice book. Um, I would put this value right at about $1,200. Okay. $1,200 is an upgrade from what the man asked, but Corey thinks that even the initial ask is too much. Offering one-third of the estimated selling price is really brutal. 
and we aren't the only ones who think so. Uh, let's cut to the chase, man. 500 bucks, that's the most I can do. It's gonna be a few hundred bucks to frame it. At the end of the day, I'm only making a few hundred bucks and it, it's gonna take me a while to sell it. Once he adopts that tone, Corey isn't dropping a penny more and Douglas must be a fan of the show because he knows that. Yeah, sure. All right, cool. I'll meet you right over there in the right chapter, right? I'm real happy with the $500. It's, it's more than I thought I'd get. Rick's on his way here daydreaming about a Maurice Sendak collection like it's the Holy Grail. This gallery has some original Sendak artwork. We're talking where the wild things are, the greatest child's book ever. These things rarely, if ever, come on the market. Now you'd think the thought of parting with a boatload of cash might put a damper on his mood, but not for Rick. He's grinning from ear to ear, ready to swipe that card without a second thought. Oh, hi, Rick. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Wait till you see this. These are sensational. These are amazing illustrations from Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. This is oh, that totally is cool. amazing. That is cool. Behind that grin, you just know he's playing the money game in his mind. Maybe dreaming of returns, or maybe just living for the thrill. Because, you know, some things are more priceless than money. But we're talking a jaw-dropping 250 grand here. They're just incredible. I mean, I love these. Where the Wild Things Are. It was one of Maurice Sendak's earliest books, written and actually illustrated as well. These are all original illustrations. Everything is one of a kind. They're in great condition, which is also, uh, you know, an amazing point uh, to any vintage art. Value of the collection ad is about $375,000. Whoa. But will this be a collector's dream or the ultimate splurge? I'm asking $375,000. That is a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> I think you can probably get about 310,000 okay. to two collectors. I could do like 300. That's not me in the middle. How about 250? You got a deal. Awesome. Congratulations. Sweet. In this case, we've got Rick facing a potential gold mine with the Warhol collection on the table. Those babies go for big bucks. So Rick's not exactly sweating bullets over this purchase. I've got uh, four original uh, Warhols. You have four original paintings by Warhol. That's correct, yes. This definitely looks like something he would do. He was um, into shoes, where you have a bunch of people working for him making art. And since it was Andy Warhol's factory, he signed everything, and uh, it was there for a Warhol. What were you looking to do with them? I was looking to sell them. OK. And I was asking about 8,000 each. Rick's interested for sure, but he's not about to take any chances. So what's his move? He's bringing in the big guns, an expert to verify those babies. Let me have someone look at it um, because I don't know enough to know that this is actually an Andy Warhol. All right, thank you. These are actually part of a print, which is not surprising. He was one of the first artists to really do mass produced originals. And that appears to be what these are, where the actual image was printed. Okay. Value-wise, I think on all of these, you probably start at the auction level at around $10,000. Really? Go up. Yeah, I think so. Once that deal's sealed, it's game over for the customer. He'll be grinning from ear to ear as he walks out of the shop, pockets full and dreams fulfilled. $20,000. I'm really thinking more like thirty-two. How about $25,000? How about twenty-seven? dollars you got to do? All right, 27000 All right, All right, thank you. Here at the heart of the pawn shop hustle, Corey finds himself amidst a fascinating exchange. Meet our enthusiastic Picasso lithograph holder, whose appreciations for art knows no bounds. What do we have here? We got my Picasso. All right. What is this, a science project? No, it's a real authentic Picasso. Corey takes center stage, navigating through the delicate balance between value and sentiment. For this customer, the artwork's not just a possession, it's a priceless treasure, an heirloom of sorts. Tell me the story about how you got it. Well, this was originally given by Picasso to my grandfather. Okay. Uh, and somehow it ended up in an outdoor boat shed in storage. <laughs> you know, I've bought Picassos for 50,000. I've bought Picassos for two or 300 bucks. With the range of price on these things, I'm gonna have to have somebody come in and take a look at it. But hold your bids, folks. This isn't your typical sale. Our Picasso off of Canado isn't here to part ways with his masterpiece. Now nah, he's got bills to settle and this lithograph might just be the ticket. I think what this is, I think it's a line of cut. It's, it's like an etching, but it's done on linoleum where they would actually carve in the image on a linoleum surface and then they would ink it. And based on everything I know about Picasso and what I see here, I feel that this is an authentic Picasso image. Great. 
That's really good to hear. The age-old dilemma to sell her to pawn. For now, it's about sorting the bills. But mark my words, should the winds of change blow in the future, our friend here might just trade his Picasso for pina coladas on a sunny beach with a hot honey. All right, man, so now it's the million dollar question. You said you wanted to pawn it. Yeah. How much are you looking to get? Well, as close to 20,000 as you can get me. All right, you got a deal, man. Jumbo will write you up. Excellent. Be careful with the Picasso, big hoss. <laughs> 5500 bucks on the line, and our dear customer here blissfully unaware of the hidden treasures within his artwork. If only he knew the true value of his art, he could be talking serious cash here. I got this picture here. Uh, it's from, like, it says 1500s. As far as I'm concerned, it's like a scary picture. I mean, I would want to hang this on my wall. I really like it. Rick's got a keen eye for opportunity, but even he's not immune to uncertainty. With the expert nowhere near available, Rick's taking a $5,500 gamble. But hey, fortune favors the bold, right? Where in the world did you get this? Well, I got it from my mother. It was in the family a lot of years, so uh, I saw the date on it. Just thought maybe it might be worth something. Yeah, believe it or not, you got something really cool here. So most of his work included demons and satanic creatures. 500 years later, he is still influencing gothic artists. Fear not, for Rick is no mere pawn in this intricate game of valuation. Nah. With his seasoned eye and dash of intuition, he wades through uncertainty like a maestro conducting a symphony. This is an original. That is his autograph. I mean, that's the way he did it in every one of his prints. It's worth $300,000. But this is not $1,500. The paper is not right. The paper would be hand-laid paper much differently than this. It's a high-stakes game, but Rick's confidence is contagious. And what of our dear customer, a retired soul basking in the glow of potential profit? The allure of just a few grand. The dear customer with an eye for making a few extra grands ready to cash in on his retirement hobby. I'll give you my one price and that will be it. I'll give you five grand for it. <sighs> All right, if it's worth seven, how about 6,500? I won't make no money. All right, okay, All right. tough negotiators. I feel really good about this buy. Rick's hunch pays off, and boy, does he make a killing. It's a win-win situation. The customer's happy, Rick's happy, and the painting, well, let's just say it's found its true worth. I don't think that this is a real early impression. The paper is too thin. I don't think it's indicative of the laid paper that they were using in the 16th century. However, it's almost certainly from the original plate. You can see the plate marks, the dimensions match up. I think it's a very nice impression circa 17th century. Well, he was skeptical of what he would face when he got called that a car awaited him outside. He could not hold his amazement when he saw a Lamborghini in its flesh drive into the parking lot. With this color palette, it's a complete ghost if it drives past at night with its lights low. Got a car outside that I think you might be interested in looking at. All right, I got a uh, lot back there. You just want to pull it around? All right, meet you out there. You said car, not supercar, man. That's right, man. It's a Lamborghini Murcielago, 2003. Nice. The thing with the supercars, these things have so much power and they're so fast. And if they weren't built like this, the thing would lift up in the air and fly. Right. So the, the entire design of this car is just so wind will push it down. People don't realize how hard it is to get a car to go 200 miles an hour. There's, what, maybe 10 production cars in the world that will do that speed? That's probably about right. Test drive is done to determine the car's functionality, factually the Harrisons of a motto. If it doesn't ride, we don't pay. To see how much the Lamborghini has to offer in luxury and state of mind if it'll meet up to the standards that it sells. Unless they know it runs as good as it looks. Don't break it, Johnny. We haven't bought it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Driving a Lambo is a dream come true. It's nice having big bosses. All right, we know it runs well. Uh, my question is, what is it really worth? Do you mind if I call somebody else down here to take a look at it? Yeah, that's not a problem. I'd be interested to see what he has to say. The beauty of a Lamborghini is in the detailing, from the first glance of the eye to the first engine purr. The Lamborghini experience can never be forgotten. It'll undoubtedly come back like a past life memory. What's going on? Man. Well, this is it. Need I say more? No, man. She speaks for herself. That's beautiful. Corey, what's your questions and concerns about this? Well, man, of course I want to know what you think it's worth and see if you can see anything wrong with it, because I sure as hell can't. Can we take a tour? We'll walk around this Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. All right, thank you, brother. That's like listening to Led Zeppelin's first record. Beauty is a thing, but it'll come down to the money, and that's all we're about in this episode. 
How much do you think this car would be worth? Beautiful. I got no complaints on the condition of this car. In today's market, I'd have to put it somewhere around 85, maybe $90,000 would be my opinion. Yeah, I'm staying at 95, man. I could use the money, but, um, you know, I think I'm going to have to take it home, put it back in the garage. News got to unsuspecting Rick one way or the other that a Willy Wonka movie prop was available for sale near him, and his instinctive love for the movie as a child drove him to rush down to the scene. One thing Rick didn't predict is the asking price tag of his favorite movie prop set. Oh, a little it. bird told me you had some uh, Willy Wonka stuff? Yes, some props from the original film. Why, are you a fan? Yeah, the Gene Wilder Wonka. This is the original hat that Gene Wilder wore in the original film. Is that insane? I just have to do this. Looking pretty stylish. <laughs> like a cat teasing its prey, the seller gave Rick a show one after the other, risking a heart explosion of excitement with the items unveiling. The excitement in Rick's voice went out the roof at the sight of The Everlasting Gobstopper, the greatest of the items from the movie and the core of the film. The price of The Gobstopper will shock you as well. That's the real deal? I don't know, is it? Is it The Everlasting Gobstopper? Yeah. With all the different flavors and it lasts forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the centerpiece of the whole film. So yeah, Slugworth uh, came to Charlie. The aesthetics of the whole collection. So um, I'm going to give you one price, and, and that's that. I, I got to stick with $100,000 for the Gobstopper. Rick is sold from the beginning. He cannot back out now when he sees the dessert right before him. Rick got a bargain deal for $105,000 at the end and a little piece atop his famous Gobstopper. So I would give you one Wonka bar, and I'd give you the everlasting Gobstopper for $115,000. All right, so $105,000 and I get a Wonka bar. I'm gonna miss that everlasting gobstopper. Sweet! You got a deal. Jeremy Maguire prop is for sale from a Los Angeles storage unit auction to Rick's pawn shop in Las Vegas. If you do the mathematics, it's a long distance, but Rick's is the best shop to buy this kind of item at a reasonable price. I have some Jerry Maguire props. We have his mission statement. Airline tickets yeah. from United for Jerry Maguire. <laughs> I'm hoping to get $5,500 for them today. If I'm able to walk out of here with $5,500, I'm going to take my kids to a theme park. You're looking to sell this? I am. So how much you want for this? $5,500. Uh, movie props go for a lot of money. Let me have someone come down and look at all this stuff, though. Okay. Hollywood property master Hope will do justice to the Tom Cruise love movie, which swept the whole universe from its feet during its time. Hope is supposed to tell us about the item, but things took a twist. Hope had this exact set long ago. Hi, chum. <laughs> <laughs> so Hope was the prop master on Jerry Maguire. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And his airline ticket. I mean, I made up airline tickets for all the cast because it helps the actor. They're no longer Tom Cruise, no longer Renee Zellweger. They are that character. You complete me, Hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, chum. <laughs> They say women have a sync signal, but I would never believe it until I saw it in real life. I mean, Rick's shop. Hope mentioned the same price as the asking price that the customer placed on her movie prop. Now Rick's hands are tied. He would love to buy, but with that sync in nature, nothing will move the lady. Well, with the right auction, with the right people in the setting, I would probably put an estimate for these items, probably at about $5,500. I'll make this really, really easy for you. I'll go 3000 not a penny more. Can't. I can't part with it for 3000 <sighs> John regrets standing in for a runaway, but hopes taking his collateral without appraisal wouldn't be one of them. If he can get something substantial, that would go a long way in mitigating his loss on a bad deal. Hey, how's it going? Good. I'm John. I'm a local bail bondsman. I had a guy skip out on me on a $50,000 bail, and I was trying to see what I can get out of this to pay the bond. So do you know much about the coin? Not much. I thought it was pretty good condition, but uh, I was hoping you could tell me. Was this graded at one time? Or? Uh, no, I've never had it graded. With the possibility of making 250 grand on the coins, Ron is probably thanking the guy for running away and leaving the coin. How would the runaway react when discovering his coin could have handled most of his problems? These coins in 1849, and they continue to make them for over 80 years. But there were design changes along the way, and this appears to be the original Liberty Head. The difference between a 61 and a 63 is the difference between 10,000 and 40,000. There's also a variant of this coin 
that's worth right around a quarter of a million dollars in this shape. Really? So do you mind uh, hanging out for a little bit and I get somebody down here? Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Andrew recognizes the piece immediately, which is a good thing. John's coin might not be a variant, but it is still an 1870s MS-63 gold piece, which collectors highly covet. A $20 lib. When we had the 1849 gold rush, America had a substantial gold supply. They started issuing the $20 gold piece. I'll look on the reverse, and that's how you could tell with the tall letters and the shield variation and the larger wingspan. Unfortunately, you do not have here. This definitely is a MS-63 or better coin, which would minimally be worth $40,000. <laughs> Rick and John are hedging on the deal, but Harrison Sr. gets tired of them stalling and closes it. With $34,000 cash, John needs just $16,000 to balance the bond. It's still a lot of money, but unless he finds the runaway, there isn't much he can do to avoid it. How much you want for it? You heard the man, 40 grand. Uh, 40 grand is not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So how about 33? 34, you got a deal. I'm gonna go for it, what the hell. All right, 34,000. Fantastic. Alex Cranmer's request. Rick took a trip down to the East Coast to see a couple of cannons he's got at his antique arms warehouse. These are machine guns from World War I and World War II. Wow. Got a bunch of antique guns along the walls, so these go from about 1700 all the way up to about 1900. Rick immediately jumps at Alex's offer to take a tour through the warehouse, hoping he can find something worth getting for the store if possible. Are they reproductions? No, they're original. There is not a modern piece or screw on them. They're all iron and wood. They're held together by the correct type of peg. So nothing was engraved on these right here? No, they were left blank. I could put my initials on it. You could, yeah. You know. <laughs> Since the two cannons had successfully caught Rick's eye, Alex swiftly called in the owner, hoping Rick can strike a deal for the cannons with her. Hi. Hey, Jen. Nice to see you. Hey, Alex. Nice to see hey, you. Rick. Nice to meet you, Rick. So these are yours? Yeah, they are. Apparently, they were at an old whiskey distillery, so it was just passed down. Okay. Aren't they awesome? They are. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> with the ammo ready and the targets all set up, Rick was pretty excited at the chance of seeing the cannons in action. Load her up. All right. Back up. All right. <laughs> yes! Since it's been proven that they do in fact work, Alex valued them to be worth a whopping 20000 and took a step back leaving Rick and the owner as they tried to drum up a deal. Okay, so Alex says they're basically worth 20. So let me give you 13 grand for them. How about 17? Cool. You got a deal, 17,000. 17,000. All right. That was quite explosive, but it most definitely falls short. If compared to this tank, Rick went out to check at the range. This is incredible. So this thing actually saw Action in Iwo Jima. This one did. It did see action. It was knocked out three times in the first 24 hours. How much you want for this thing? Um, I'm looking to get a million and a half. That price is a huge bomb. And to be honest, a million and a half for an item, that's just too much. But Rick seemed a bit interested regardless. Okay, but we get to drive it? You can drive it and you can shoot it. It's pretty damn cool. Um, you need to go call Corey. But before I do anything, I'm going to have to drive it and I'm going to have to fire it. Okay, here we go. With the seller's permission, Rick and the rest got the chance to take this tank out for a spin with the chance of even firing it a bit if they heard the seller correctly. Here we go. Nice job, Rick. The door of that car was up for like four seconds. Done blowing things up, Rick tries to get Alex's take on the tank before they can finally get down to business. I mean, it is what it is. It speaks for itself. Shermans are the most desired American tank from World War II. It runs well. It fires well. One and a half million. I, I think that's a fair price. Alex has managed to convince Rick of the fact that the price, as scary as it might seem, is not in any way, shape, or form beyond the standard price for one of these things. And now it's all up to Rick to dig deep to find out if he really wants the tank or not. It's amazing. It's got amazing history. Everything about it is absolutely great. But um, I'd so out of the ballpark for me, man. <laughs> 
At the store, it was a huge surprise when a customer actually decided to roll in her very huge antique cannon with the hopes of having Rick take a look. This is incredible. So in the 70s and the 80s, guys started building these things and cannon clubs became really, really popular. I love how he made the carriage. It's all solid oak. It's a lot of hard work. Did he make the cannon? I'm not sure about the cannon. I know he was a machinist. Being part of a cannon club with her husband, this lady really knows her stuff. So Rick was quick to direct all the questions that he had her way. Have you shot this one? Yes, most recently about a month ago. What's the farthest you've hit a target? Just under 200 yards. That's impressive. How much do you want for it? I'm thinking like 25,000. Would you say 15? No, 15 is too low. Due to her busy schedule, the lady doesn't exactly have the time to head out to test the cannon at the range, but Rick really wants it, so he made a really risky move. 17? 18? Well, I know a guy who would love this, so I'm willing to risk it. I'll do 18. Okay. To test the cannon, Rick and gang immediately headed on over to meet an expert who could also help share some insights while they were at it, killing two birds with one cannonball in the process. So what do you think of this thing? I think it's a really nice piece. Solidly built, good frame, good carriage. It's got a military grade barrel on it. It's from a 40 millimeter Bofors. So that's what makes this better than most black powder cannons. Most black powders are smooth bore and they're out and go anywhere. Ron, the expert, claims the cannon would most definitely be worth right around the amount Rick bought it for. But that's only if it fires as expected. Two, one. Here we go. Everything looks good, nothing's moved on it. So how much do you think this is worth? I would put a price tag at 25,000. Out on a work trip with Chumley, Rick decided to make a quick detour to check a bronze cannon a customer was hoping to sell, with Alex there to help check it out. Yeah, this thing is a monster. I mean, I saw photos of it, but I didn't actually realize it was quite this big. But this is gorgeous. And this thing would have been cast as solid bronze. They use bronze because bronze was stronger and it was better at sea. This the cannon's got a huge price tag on it, but what's got Rick worried the most is the very rough condition the cannon is in. So she wants $75,000 for it, okay? I don't know if that's a great price. I don't know if this thing will blow up when we fire it. There's a million things we need to know. And, uh, <laughs> and if it does fail, uh, it's much better to have it fail under low pressure than high pressure. For something that old, checking if it's still good to go with a shot is necessary. But instead of using a huge charge, they decided to settle for small pellets that would spread like a buckshot. So this pokes the powder bag, you take the fuse, and stick it down into the black powder bag. Oh! <laughs> Wow! It has been hit. I mean, it did hit it. I could see it from yeah. here. Oh. With the test fire being a success, they can now discuss the price of the cannon before moving on to the most important segment of the day, the negotiation. All right, so what do you think of it? Fire's like a champ. It didn't blow up. I thought it fired great. I, I love this cannon. It's got great history, beautiful markings, and it fires, and it's great to look at. I think 50,000 is fair. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, man. All Appreciate right. it. Unfortunately, it isn't exactly worth $75,000 like the lady thought it would be, but fifty grand is definitely a lot of money to spend on a cannon. Now, all she has to do is try to convince Rick before she can get everything remotely close to that deal. Still a lot of money for a cannon. Let me take it off your hands for $35,000. That way your husband won't try it out and blow himself up. $45,000. I'll tell you what, I'll do $42,000. Deal. Okay. After getting a call from a customer who claimed to have a set of very interesting items in his possession, Rick took a ride down to the middle of nowhere just to satiate his curiosity. This is pretty cool. I mean, you don't see them that often. Mm. And they're about the condition you would expect for these things. Mm. The English Navy started using these in the 1500s. Eventually, they were just basically used for everything from celebrations, signals on a battlefield, whatever you needed a big bang. This was it. As odd as the thunder mugs may seem, since they don't exactly look too pleasing to the eye, it seems effective still. Okay, Bolivia, I've been collecting all my life. Um, I collect whatever's around to collect wherever I am. I'm not certain, but either brass or bronze, yeah. And it's really hard to date these, but especially from the patina on them, I imagine there's well over 100 years old. Rick finally decides to ask the most important question. How much is he willing to take for this poor man's cannons? I mean, how much you want for them? 
I'm thinking eight hundred dollars a fair price. Okay, we'll see how loud they are first. That works. Before getting down to negotiations fully, Rick and the customer decided to test it out first to see if it's still in working condition and for the fun of it as well. So that's the Canon fuse, right? Plain old Canon fuse. Okay. I'm gonna be put the same length fuse in each one of them. Light them like that. Okay. <laughs> In this episode, an avid collector of cannons, who's never ever managed to close a deal with Rick, despite their numerous encounters, decided to meet with him in the hopes of showing him a parade cannon he was looking to sell. Can you tell me anything about it? This is obviously a breech-loading cannon. You insert a cartridge in it that's preloaded with powder, and it produces a very nice, substantial report. So it's loud. Extremely loud. Rick tries to know where the guy got the cannon from and as much information as he's got that could possibly help point out its origin. Where did you get this thing? I bought it from a museum that was deacquisitioning some items. Okay. Did they have any paperwork or anything else with uh, it when you bought it? Not really, to tell you the truth. The fact that he doesn't have any paperwork on hand to help is actually quite concerning, so Rick had no other option than to call in his antique arms expert, Sean. So what research have you done about this? Well, the first owner would have been the GAR Post and the Sons of Veterans. They had it built for them for the parades. Civil War veterans, they would want to have GAR conventions. With everyone there, Rick finally asks for the chance to see the cannon in action, which would definitely be the highlight of the day. After all, who wouldn't like a good boom? And you fired it? Yeah, I have fired it. I really want to hear this thing go boom. Let's burn some powder. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> there it goes in like that. And it will lock in position. And you need that lanyard. Stick it on here. And it's With the ammo set in place, Sean knew things were going to get loud, so he made sure to warn the guys. It'd be pretty bad if they were to get exposed to the deafening sound waves from the launch, after all. Guys, make sure your earpieces are in, and it wouldn't even hurt to put your hands over your ears on top of that when this thing goes. That was definitely awesome to see, but Rick has some very major concerns. A question that could determine if it'll be fine to try to get the cannon or not. And that's where Sean has to step in. 1899 and forward, there can be some problems. Yeah. I want to make sure if I buy this thing, the feds aren't going to be, you know, running through my door and throwing me in cuffs. After a very thorough examination of the cannon, Sean makes a few discoveries. But unfortunately, they're not convincing enough for Rick to just take that chance. Down at the bottom, it looks like SEPT for the abbreviation of September. 1903. I, I can't even make an offer. Okay. Transaction between two pawn shop owners is set on stage for a potential windfall as an 1830 West Point cadet musket takes a spotlight valued at a hefty $5,800, but acquired for a measly $400. The air is thick with anticipation, offering a glimpse into a high-stakes transaction. Hey, what can I help you with? Hey, I have a West Point cadet military musket. Um, I'm thinking it's worth around $5,800. How much you get it for? 400. Rick has an upper hand on the other pawnee because of confidential documentation at his beck and call. It's only natural that other pawn shops will liaise with his office. Any paperwork or documentation on it, it's hard to sell in my shop. We all know which ones have bigger markets for specialty items, and we all love to get cash on the spot. The conversation delves deeper into the musket's history, revealing the allure of owning a piece tied to West Point's legacy. And I believe it's an 1830 Springfield West Point Cadet Military Musket. West Point is the oldest military academy in the U.S. Rick is fascinated by this piece of American history in the form of a gun that could have a twisted and faded story. However, the occupation always requires thorough checks because making a profit is the aim of the shop. If this was used by cadets in the 1830s, Ulysses S. Grant, so if this is the real deal, it's an unbelievable piece. Let me get my buddy Sean down here. He's an expert in arms and armor. Okay. It's here, Sean, the firearms expert, injecting expertise into the mix. As Sean meticulously examines the musket, he throws tension up like a bubble, and it spread like wildfire. Hopes soar high, pinned on the possibility of this musket being the real deal and worth a small fortune. Was that they came up with a scaled down version of the standard musket. It just didn't fly. So what they decided to do was, well, you know, West Point, why don't we give them to the cadets as training muskets? 
If this is not, the specifics are listed in them, then that's a tip off that it may not be the cadet musket. Alas, Sean's evaluation dents those dreams, but only by a little. His detailed analysis confirms this musket as a standard model 1816, not the coveted cadet version. Disappointment washes over the room as the seller's expectations deflate. Fortunately, this is not the cadet musket. Really? This is your standard model 1816. This is 42 inches, almost six and three quarters. If it were, this thing would be worth anywhere from five to 10,000. Negotiations resume with the seller settling on an $825 price tag for the standard musket. It's a bittersweet moment, balancing relief that is still valuable with the lingering regret of unmet treasure expectations. How much you want for it? About a thousand. I'll give you 700 bucks. How about nine? How about 750? Can you go eight and a half? Eight and a quarter. You know, eight and a quarter sounds fair. The narrative takes a thrilling twist as the musket heads to a firing range for a test of its functionality. Suspense hangs heavy in the air. Will this aged firearm prove reliable once more? The musket's one shot determines a lot for its future sales. What they had to go through to learn how to shoot one of these muskets. Tension peaks as Chum Lee steps up to the firing challenge, infusing the scene with the mix of anticipation and humor. Bets fly secretly as confidence is put to the test. You are, my man. All right. Laughter mingles with disappointment as Chum Lee's shot misses the target. Banter and betting bring a lighthearted conclusion. The story closes with a sense of camaraderie. Woo! There's gotta be a hole in there somewhere. The initial encounter reveals the unusual combination of crutches with a concealed pistol, piquing curiosity and setting the stage for intrigue. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, I got these crutches here. How much you want for these things? I have no clue. You're telling me information that I guess. Firearm experts' arrival adds depth to the story, hinting at the historical significance of these crutches turned weapons. The crafting process, as well as the artistic hinting poured into the making. Um, they are flintlock. Wow, that is so cool. Normally there'd be a side plate here. It looks like an existing pair of crutches. It would be loaded and you'd kind of bring it up and fire. The idea of test firing these antique crutch pistols adds suspense and anticipation. It's a pivotal moment to determine their functionality. The decision to test fire the pistols demonstrates the links taken to evaluate their worth. It's not just about historical context, it's about functionality. Only I like to give you an immediate evaluation and a price. I'm not there with these. I'd really like to test fire. Highlighting the pistol's still working condition, the successful test firing adds an element of surprise and delightful comedy display of a scene from 1940. It's not just a relic, it's a functional piece of history. That one's ready. But the final evaluation and negotiation phase introduces the monetary value of the crutch pistols, changing the focus from historical significance to potential profit of $25,000 to the seller. Uh, I think at the right auction, $25,000 for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the seller's decision to accept $15,000 signifies a successful transaction. It took Rick many worldly convictions to get this amount out of his pocket. So what will you take from? Alex said 25 racks. I want 25 racks. So I'll give you 10 grand. Let's go 20. Can we go 20? Let's go 20,000. I'll be, I'll be fair with you. I'll give you 13 grand. 15. Can we go to 15 at least? I'll risk it at 15. Yeah, that sounds All good. Right. The scene opens with a playful exchange of humor about eye candy, the beautiful hunting rifle from the 1840s by the famous J.K. Rector. I thought I'd bring in some uh, eye candy here. Some eye candy. I thought it was a gun. <laughs> the introduction of the unique 1840s rifle by Rector adds an element of curiosity and intrigue to the story of this gun. The hunting rifle that was made by Rector. I'm a collector. The seller arrived at the pawn shop well prepared and knowledgeable about his gun. Where did you get this thing? I found it on the internet and did some research on it. Every small town had someone who made guns. The hardware was like English imports and French imports because this looks really European right here. It was a lot skinnier before. The Rick's knowledge doesn't cover this gun maker, Rector. And before making a sales pitch and finalizing the price, he seeks assistance from someone more knowledgeable. How much you want for it? 3,200 for it. Do you mind if I have someone look at it? Gunsmith's evaluation reveals the historical significance of the firearm. 
the popularity being durability for hunting proficiency and the mention of it being created by an American gunmaker before the Civil War adds context to its value. Guns made in America before the Civil War are popular for collectors. He was really well known for target rifles, which this is not. This is a hunting rifle. Yes. The gunsmith's desire to learn more about J.H. Rector's firearm design creates suspense and anticipation for the appraisal. These are actually fishing lures for nighttime, but I use them as bore lights. Drop them down, and then we can see the barrels are rifled. The gun expert's appraisal provides insight into the firearm's historical use. The previous owner would be a daunting hunter by the look of how the gun was engaged in a lot of adventures itself. So what do you think it's worth? I think a fair market value is $1,500 to $1,750. The negotiation phase reflects the seller's willingness to compromise, balancing historical value, customers window shopping edit and considering the risk and market demand for his valuable gun. You know what happens with old guns. That's cool. And then walk away. <laughs> How about if we split the difference? 1100 What the hell? 1100 bucks. All right. Jim introduces the scene in Pennsylvania, setting the stage for an antique firearm appraisal dated to the 1700s. Alex's initial reaction adds an amusing touch, matching the seller's energy with his childhood memory. I'm in Pennsylvania meeting with someone who's selling a brown vest wall gun from the 1700s. The seller's asking for $7,500 for it, and I brought Alex out here to help me take a look at it. Wow, firing order. Is it? Yeah. Alex provides historical context, turning the antique firearm into a captivating piece of history, not forgetting the usability during war. The mention of King George III's cipher adds depth to the gun's significance of being an old antique. Here, there's some type of crown right here with a little arrow and stuff. Yeah, um, so that's King George III's cipher. Jim might buy the gun at this point. He's amused by the ammunition size and making. It's an intriguing visual as he holds up the large lead ball. You want to see how big the balls are? I do. All that talk about the gun is like appetizing Jim's mouth for a sweet meal. He's all ready to take aim at this point, but not on Alex's watch. I definitely want to fire it. Uh, you can tell by the way this is formed up here that it is the original. As the firearm expert prepares to fire the antique rifle, the anticipation builds. Put the rod away. All right, I got a target that I made up. The scene transitions to the field for the firing demonstration. We hit one, it'll explode. Well, let's load her up. One thing that could be learned about manual gun loading through this satisfactory scene is Alex showing off his gun handling skills while preparing the gun for a live show of the Battle of Walled Gun versus Clay Pots. Grains of black powder, almost golf ball size lead ball, then a little bit of toilet paper, but you also want the ball to travel. Don't try this at home, but that's a supervision of an expert. Jim had to resist the urge to take a shot himself to preserve the gun's buying value. The explosive power of the wall gun takes every one of the three grown adults by surprise. Whoa! Yes! The scene concludes with a satisfied Jim and Alex discussing the firearm's value to be undervalued for the customer's asking price. The humor in Jim's reluctance to call Alex again for his expertise adds a lighthearted touch to the atmosphere. I think you should give him the 7500 because I think it's worth 20000 Look, these are, you just don't see them. The final negotiation between Jim and the seller is now tensioned. Jim's consideration of the antique's rarity, the seller's realization of the worth of his possession, and Alex's valuation make for a visually engaging exchange. You wanted 7500 I'll give it to you. How about 20000 Would you take ten? No way. Jim's contemplation and eventual meeting up to the seller's price closed the scene on a successful note. The scene concludes with Jim reflecting on the potential profit. His excitement to go do more practice in New York adds an entertaining and optimistic touch to the ending. $14,000 and we got a deal. I'll do fourteen. Fourteen thousand. dollars All right. Let me go uh, make a phone call back to Vegas and we'll figure out how we're going to get you paid. Okay, great. All right. Now that I got the sale, I'm going to go take some shots of my own in New York City.